Welcome to the Essential Element, the Element of Education podcast. My name is Christian Page. I'm excited to be your host today. Uh, Thank you for being here. Uh, Thank you for taking the time to join us. I know you could have been anywhere else in the world, but you're choosing to be here, and that lets me know that you care about education the same way that we do. Today, we're going to be showcasing a conversation that we had with Jody. Uh, Jody is a social worker at SAMI. Um, She is passionate about her work, creates space for students to be able to fail, to fail forward, um, to have grace, right? And to really find worthiness in themselves. Our conversation with Jody was actually a lot of fun, Uh, left me a lot to reflect with, um, and also talked heavily about meeting the needs of students, not in the traditional way that we've thought about it, but in a way, right, where we can work hard uh, to make sure that they have a sense of value and a sense of belonging. So without further ado, is our conversation with Jody. The art school, we really believe in like relationships, and that is emphasized through a mentor group. And so um, I wholeheartedly believe in that. What do they need? I have to be able to answer that question. And that takes a little bit of time. Big, the biggest teacher, I think, is failure. The brain works in failure. And those failures are actually synapses rewiring themselves in your brain. And think about where you want to be. Because when you find your place, you find your people. And our purpose is attached to people. You know, when there's a phenomenal teacher, uh, when there's a phenomenal educator, when there's a phenomenal mentor, one of the mistakes that we make is we make it look too easy. Like everyone sees the shining moment on stage. No one sees, right, like the hard time spent. Whew. All right. Well, Jody, thank you for uh, coming to have a conversation with us today. Uh, really grateful that you're taking the time. Um, and I'm excited to get to know more about you and the important role that you play here at SAMI. Um, but outside of that, too, right? I'm excited to get to know more about you as a human. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. It's a yeah. pleasure. For sure. Well, thank you for being here. And for those of uh, us who have not gotten the opportunity to know you, um, who are you? Why SAMI? How did you land here? What do you do here? Um, why do you keep coming back on Monday? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> that's a lot. I'll try and do my best to kind of walk through each of those things. Um, but help me along the way if I sure. like, get misguided. So I'm Jody Dumont. I'm the school social worker at SAMI. I've been here since um, 2018. Um, prior to coming to SAMI, I was a medical social worker. I was working um, at the Pierce County AIDS Foundation. As a, um, as a mental health case manager and then also the client services director for the AIDS Foundation. And before that, I worked in a self-contained um, special education classroom at a high school. So um, I kind of moved away from education for quite a number of years to work um, at the AIDS Foundation and then just felt like I needed a refresh and thought, you know, I, I wonder what it would be like to go back into a high school setting. And at that point, I'd been working with adults for so long that it felt kind of intimidating to think about working with kids again. Um, but I decided to, to just see what was out there. And Sammy was hiring um, what was a, a part-time position at the time. Um, it's now full-time, but at the time it was part-time and my kids were little at the time. And I thought, part-time, back in the school setting, high, sc- high school is my jam. I like being at a high school. so. Um, I, I went for it, and it was a good match, and here I am these, all these years later. I think this is my ninth year um, at SAMI, so I've just been, I've been loving it. It's a great, I feel like it's a great fit for me, and I feel like I'm a great fit for SAMI, so it, it's been working out really well. So. Yeah. And it's awesome. Uh, grateful that you're here and a part of this community, and you occupy a really special space, right? Um, I think in traditional education, there's often this separation between right, people who are teachers or people who provide adjacent supports or educa- and realizing that like all of us are important. Um, and especially if we're going to talk about, you know, the whole child or uh, I always make the joke of like running into my teacher at the grocery store. Have you ever had this experience before? Right. And I think uh, in the same way that I didn't think that my teacher existed outside of the gro- outside of the classroom, right? There are a lot of us in education who forget that our students also 
exists outside of that space. And so I'm curious, right? Like what, what led you into social work? What uh, is a very, right? It's a specialized field and it, it takes someone with a big heart to be a part of the conversation. What, what, what led you to being a part of this specifically in a high school setting? I think, well, specifically in a high school setting, I, I, I just feel like it's such a treat to get to work with kids who are kind of in those teenage and late teenage years. It's a time of great personal growth and exploration. Um, you know, kids are at the point where they're um, kind of trying to figure out who they are in the world. They're taking the values that were, um, that have been instilled by their own families and they're deciding which of these values are truly mine and which of these are maybe not mine. Maybe they're my, um, you know, my, my, one of my parents or a family member's values, but they're not something I want to carry on in my own life. Um, and so there's just so much exploration, personal exploration, academic exploration, career exploration that goes on in those four years. And it's just such a, a cool opportunity to be um, present with students during that time of their life. Um, so that, I think that's part of the reason why I enjoy high school so much. Um, Another thing is it just gives me hope for the world. You know, we got a lot going on in the world and sometimes it's easy to get kind of um, down or disillusioned by kind of all the problems of the world. But when I spend my days with teenagers, I always walk away thinking, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay. And these kids are, are great. They're, uh, they're thoughtful and they're, um, they care deeply about each other and about um, important issues in the world and they they are present and they just they're they're soaking it all in and so it just it gives me hope um, for the future that these are our our future leaders and sometimes people you know look down on the generations that are younger than their own generation um, but I feel like those people just have not had the opportunity to actually spend the quality time with those young people because I think I really believe that if they did they would feel much better about um, the, the generations that are following in their footsteps and, and just the, the cool things that I get to be witness to. So um, I feel like there was another part of that question that maybe I, I missed, but um, that's, why, that's why high school. It's just such a rich um, time in a person's life and it's just a, a, a cool opportunity to be able to be present for that. So. Oh. I get kind of giddy when people talk about um, high school students in a, in a good light, because I think that, you know, like you said, right, there are some people um, who don't always get to see what we see, who don't always know the same way that we know. Um, but I'm really curious about something that you said there, right, of like deciphering which of these beliefs belong to me uh, and which of these beliefs belong to whatever ecosystem I was a part of prior to. And I'm really interested, right, as a professional, like how you walk that line, right? Like as educators, we never want to be persuasive in making someone believe the things that we want to believe. But I also want students to operate in a world with beliefs that serve them, right? And I know that some things will not. And so there's a hands off, right? Of letting them draw their own conclusions. But I'm curious about like, how, how, do, you, how do you help students walk that line um, without finding yourselves, right? Like the big word in the, the lexicon right now, you're indoctrinating, right? right like right, right. Yeah, how, how yeah. does that work? Well, I, I mean, First and foremost, it's not about me. It's it's 100% not about me. There's plenty of students who who develop um, different or you know unique beliefs that might not be my own, and that that's 100% their right and their obligation as a you know a member of our community to do that. Um, so it's it's 100% not about me. But what I feel like I can do is offer the space and create the, the, um, the platform for them to feel safe to explore those different thoughts and ideas. And I know my, you know, it's been a long time since I was 17, 18 years old, but the beliefs that I had at that point in time aren't necessarily the beliefs that I had now. So it's, we all are in a process of evolving. So I feel like our role, um, you know, as educators in general, but me specifically as a social worker is just to create the space, to allow it to be a safe place to, say things, to make mistakes, to like have an idea that I don't hold on to forever, but right now I'm interested in exploring it. Um, so I, I feel like that, that comes up for me a lot, is just the idea of, <clears throat> of creating space, of, um, of offering that safety and that, um, 
that opportunity to kind of explore in a, in a way that, that feels good, that feels comfortable, that feels non-judgmental, that feels like uh, I don't have to be stuck in this. I'm okay to explore it to, to whatever degree I want. Uh, uh, that feels like such a contrast, right? In a, in a world that's really um, evaluative, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, really instantly, based on your grade, like you get instant feedback if you're doing something well or not. Um, tell me more about the value of that space, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think we, we oftentimes put a lot of pressure on, on students, especially high school students, to kind of get things figured out. There's, you oftentimes hear pe adults asking kids, what are you going to do after high school? What are you going to major in in college if you're going to college? What are you going to, you know, what is your next step? What is your next, your next plan? And that can be intimidating for a student. Some students, it, it's fine. You know, they're like, oh, this is totally what I want to do. I've got it kind of figured out, or this is where I want to explore. Um, these are, you know, my interests. They've been my interests for a long time. So some students are, are good to go with that. Others are like, oh, it's a, it's a big, wide, crazy world out there, and I haven't yet figured out my place in it. And so I think just being able to say not what's the big picture of your life, but being able to say, what is the next best step for you in this big, crazy world? And having that be good enough, just knowing, just being able to explore that next, next step, even if it's just a tiny step in a direction that you're interested in, and, and having it be okay to not have it all figured out right now um, at 18. Because we, you know, oftentimes adults don't have it all figured out at <laughs> 25 or 35 or 45 or 75 sometimes, um, and, and having that be okay. So kind of taking the pressure off of, you need to know, you need to get it figured out, and you need to like plan your course for the rest of your life at age 18. Sometimes that's realistic, and sometimes it's just not. So, and either is okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, should I poke the bear or not? <laughs> Right. Uh, because I hear a lot of contrast in your language, right? Like you providing safety and then the contrast being pressure, right? Of like taking the first step without seeing the entire staircase and have it all figured out. Right. I'm curious about like on, on this side of that, right? Like something that we know as common. Right? What, what frustrates you most about the impact that that has on students? When we talk about the pressure of having it all figured out, of right. make sure you do this. And, right, it, and I know that you have to see the impact of that. Right. I guess the thing that frustrates me most about that is that I think inadvertently sometimes students get the message that they're not good enough. If they don't have it all figured out or if they're not on a path that's their you know, forever path or at least a, a good chunk of their career type of a path, that there's something wrong with that. Um, and I, I, I do not believe that educators get into this field to tell kids that there's something wrong with them. You know, that's not an intentional message that we send. But sometimes it is an unintentional message that, that kids pick up, as if I'm not keeping pace with what's um, kind of the traditional expectations and there, there's something that's um, wrong with me or that I'm not good enough. And that's not the case. It's just not the case. Wherever, wherever a student happens to find themselves at age you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, that is good enough. It is okay to be kind of in that place of of knowing or not knowing. Um, oh, can I give you a little bit of preamble for this next question? Sure. All right, because I'm, I'm really interested in this because I, I, I really love um, kind of the way that you're describing about holding space, right? Of like having grace for students, having um, right, an opportunity for them to explore, right? To fail, but not feel the pressure of. Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm, I'm of the school of thought, and forgive me for going a little bit on a roller coaster for this one, um, but you've heard the maxim right, that, that, that like hurting people hurt people. Yeah. Um, and I always wanna believe the theory that healing people can also heal people. Um, and I know that oftentimes we project expectations onto people based on the expectations that we give ourselves. And so I'm, I'm wondering, right, like with all of the grace that you're providing, with all the space that you're providing, with all of the um, right, like safety that you're providing, how, do you, how do you take care of yourself? How do you afford that to yourself? That's a great question. Uh -huh. That's a great question. Um, so when I was in my social work education, when I was in the MSW program, I remember one of the teachers saying that the life, the life expectancy of a 
social worker is five years. And I thought, in that moment, and I still remember this, I thought, that is not going to be me. I'm going to be, I'm going to thrive in this profession and I'm going to thrive long term in this profession. And I think one of the ways to do that is to have a rich life outside of work. You, you've got to, um, you, you can't just make it all about the work. Um, so I, I, sometimes it's hard, right? It's easy to get consumed with um, your professional identity and your professional life. And especially when you're in a, a helping profession, it's, um, you know, it, it would be easy to kind of become consumed with the challenges and the problems that students are facing, take that home and just kind of let that gnaw at you over, over the days, the weeks, the months, and the years. And, and that's not going to have a positive outcome. So I tr try very hard to maintain my own community of, of friends and family that I'm well connected with. Um, I try very hard to engage in um, activities that I enjoy. I like to ski. I like to hike. Um, I have a dog. I like to take the dog for a walk um, and, and just really, you know, it, I was actually, ironically, I was in, a, in an ethics training yesterday. And one of the points that they made was that self-care is not just a luxury, but it's a, it's a professional responsibility. Um, so that, and that if you aren't taking care of yourself, that you won't be able to take care of others. So that you, it, not only should you, but you really have to in order to thrive long term in any kind of, you know, teaching included. Um, but social work, um, for me in particular, is a, you know, it, in order to be a long term thriver, you have to prioritize um, self care. And it, it sounds kind of cliche, right? You know, it, you hear a lot of people, what do you do for self care? And it sounds kind of cheesy and cliche. But, um, but when you kind of look at it more as a, a professional obligation, that by taking care of myself, I'm better able to take care of students and to, to support students along the way. Um, that, that means something to me, so. Yeah, who yeah. pauses to take notes, right? Like that's, <laughs> as a professional responsibility, mm -hmm. like that, oh, that sits so yeah, heavy, yeah. right? Yeah. A professional obligation, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, that puts it to a whole nother level, right? It's not just, and I think, um, you know, a lot of times people are in the uh, in the helping profession or the teaching profession, and they there there's some there's a almost a like a weird pride in losing yourself in that sometimes, and to be able to say no, that's not okay. You've got to step away from that sometimes. You've got to prioritize yourself um, as more than just a, a a selfish act. It's not a selfish act. It's a it's a it's an obligation. So. Yeah. And, oh, I'm like, turn this off now, go home, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I normally don't get uh, flustered in that way, but I, th there's something that resonates so heavily um, when you make that statement. And I'm just, ah, and I don't apologize. I'm grateful that you said it, right? Um, I'm gonna switch gears for a little bit and, um, Talk about really like your responsibility as a social worker, right? And I think uh, in the elements framework, right, there's a real uh, prioritization on relationship and mentorship. And um, I'm curious, right, because there's a trope in the world of stereotypes for social workers about, right, like you have your caseload and these people are numbers and so on and so forth and have to get past and compliance and, right, all of the, the silliness that Hollywood might show us about a type of profession, but I'm curious about how you prioritize relationships and mentorship so that students don't become a number on the caseload, but you know, you're dealing with actual humans. Like what, what does that look like for you? Well, for me, it's gone back a long time. It, as a, even as an early social worker, whenever I felt confused or conflicted or unsure, I had a, a patient or a client who I didn't feel like was progressing, the answer for me has always been focus on the relationship. If, if you're stuck, if you're confused, if you're not making progress, focus on the relationship. And so the value that um, the partner schools and, and Sam, what I see at SAMI, it, it just speaks to that. I mean, we hear that all the time here. So that just really resonates as a, a value that I've held for a really long time. Um, and I think there's so much about SAMI that just kind of naturally um, 
plays into that, just even our, our location. We're in the woods, students spend a lot of time outside, they get a lot of fresh air, they get you know time in nature. I mean, all of these things, it's a, it's a way to kind of um, build upon the personal relationships. And, and if a student's able to have not only personal relationships with their, uh, their teachers, their peers, the staff here, um, but a personal relationship with nature as well, it just, it, it makes it even that much better. Um, so focusing on relationship in whatever way that makes sense to the students. Some students are a little intimidated by, uh, you know, a, a strong, hey, I want to, you know, get to know you. And like, what? Why do you want to get to know me? It's a little intimidating. So in whatever way that works for the student. Um, and I, I just feel like um, just our location here plays into that so nicely. Um, and just it makes it a, a I don't know, it, it's a, a comfortable and pleasant place to be which oftentimes will kind of lower the guard of somebody who's a little bit skeptical of that approach right off the bat, so. Oh man, now I wanna ask you like a spicy question, if that's all right. All right. Um, because I think that this comes up a lot, uh, at least in my practice, and I'm, I'm almost using you as like, where's the advice, <laughs> um, right? But like there's a, a responsibility as adults in education to meet the needs of students, mm -hmm. right? To uh, help them along, right, when we notice something that's off, right, to be with them. But there's also maxims in the world that say things like, you know, I can't want something more for someone than they want it for themselves. Um, you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped, right? Like, how, how do you walk the line of, right, providing, um, you know, solutions and resources for needs and uh, allowing students to have autonomy and personal responsibility in the conversation? Right. Well, here's my unpopular opinion. Come on. Um, <laughs> I hear people all the time say, you can't work harder than, you can't work harder for them than they are working for themselves. I hate when people say that. Come on. It, um, because I feel like sometimes people don't think they're worth it. And so that's why they're not working hard for them, for themselves, right? And to show them that you believe that they are worth it by being willing to work hard for them, even when they don't have it within themselves to work hard for themselves. I feel like that's one of the best gifts you can give someone is to show them they're worth it. Um, and so I, you know, I, you hear it all the time. I've heard it every, every year in my social work career. Uh, people will say you can't work harder for them than they are willing to work for themselves. I think that's a... A, a load of crap, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, um, it, not that you should do everything for somebody. That's, you know, that, that's kind of the opposite, right? You, you, can't, um, you can't do everything for somebody and you have to empower people to help themselves for sure. Um, but you have to also be willing to um, do what you're asking them to do. You have to be willing to do that too. And it, if it's working hard on their behalf, then you've got to be willing to do that too. And to show them, show them that you value them enough to do that, um, even when they're not able to for whatever reason. Yeah. Ooh, come on, integrity. <laughs> I'm here for it. Man, I love that answer. I'm, I'm wondering, right, like is, because I'm hearing you like, we got to love folks through yeah. some things, right? Yeah. I'm wondering if there's a, a story that comes to mind in your experience of being here, right, where someone has, right, like reconnected to the idea of worthiness mm -hmm. because of the actions that have been shown on either behalf of you or, or educators in this building. Well, there was a student that I worked with um, my first year at Sammy who, um, you know, we're in the education field, oftentimes you hear adults say, well, what do you want to, where do you see yourself in five years? Well, this particular student didn't even see themselves as being alive in five years. They, they couldn't see, they, it, that question was just so out of their frame of reference because they, they were struggling so much that they, they just had a hard time seeing the next day, you know, let alone the next year, the next two years, the next five years. It was just out of their scope of reference. Um, and... I, certainly not just me, but I was part of a team of people that kind of rallied around this kid and we were consistent. I think that's important. It's like, you are welcome here, no matter how you bring yourself in, you know, bring your, bring your anxiety with you, bring your doubt with you, bring your depression with you when you come, but just fully bring yourself. Um, and we will accept whatever you bring. 
um, and it's, it's going to be okay. We're going to help walk with you through this. Um, and so, you know, myself and a number of other, of other teachers and staff here really recognized the, the pain that this kid was in and the, the difficult situation that this, that this student was facing and um, just created a, an unconditional place of acceptance. And they graduated and they um, went on to go to TCC and are pursuing their education there. Um, recently had a baby and are, you know, kind of doing the family thing now, doing the mom thing now. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, it would be disingenuous to say their life is great and perfect now, all because of Sammy. I mean, that would be like a nice little bow to put on it. Certainly not the case. They have their challenges. They still struggle. They still, you know, face really difficult things that are hard to overcome. Um, but they're five years out of high school and they're doing pretty darn well. Wow. And that's, uh, I, I think, a huge success um, for, for them and for the people that, that cared about, about her in her, you know, a, a great time of need. Um, and I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling really uh, vulnerable in the moment. And I appreciate you naming that and saying that um, this week was uh, the, the four year anniversary of a student that we lost um, at high school where I was working. Um, and I don't, I don't know that there's, right, like, I think grief happens in seasons. Um, I think it, you know, shows up when you least expect it, but it's been really heavy um, on my heart this week. And to hear you say, right, like someone who didn't necessarily see themselves as alive in five years, um, I think it's important to remember that like this work is transformational. You know what I mean? And so I appreciate you naming that. I'm, I'm wondering, right, like, um, forgive me for this for a second, but I have a firm belief in the world, right, that the things that we believe will often determine our behaviors and our behaviors will often determine our results. And I've been in a space, you know, of holding um, too many young people, and I mean physically holding um, too many young people who who are at the, right, the, the end of this conversation, right? Who have kind of lost will to be alive. And I'm wondering as educators, right? Like what beliefs do we need to hold about young people to counteract some of the difficulty that I think has become too common in the lives of students? Yeah, I guess for me, it's a, a, an unwavering belief in the resilience of the human spirit. Um, Students are going through a lot, a lot. I mean, it, humans in general are going through a lot, but in particular, I think our young people are facing. Um, just, you know, I, one of the things that I expected when I moved from working with adults to working, going back to work with kids was that they'd be facing kid problems. They're not, they're facing adult problems. Um, the, the problems that you see in the teenagers these days are, similar and sometimes identical to the problems that we're seeing adults face. It's heavy, it's a lot, um, but there is such resilience and there's such, um, such a, a reason to hope um, because of that resilience that I, that I see. And, and um, kids want to, when they're facing difficult things, they want um, that, helping hand. They want, and, and they're so willing sometimes to, to reach out to an adult who just says, hey, I see you. I, I see that you're going through something and I want to be here with you. And they're, they're, they're just kind of craving that sometimes. And once they, once they see that, they're really able to say, okay, what's my next, what's my next move? Or how can, I, how can I be, how can I navigate this in a way that doesn't feel quite so lonely and awful? So uh, I'm curious on the other side of that, are there other beliefs that you think we need to abandon as adults? You are, you've, you've already named, right? Like the idea of, like, no, no, I can want something for someone <laughs> more than they want from this. And me showing them, right? Like might reconnect them. So it, are, are there things that you think we need to abandon that are too common of beliefs? That contribute to some of the difficulties we're looking at? That's a really great question. I guess sometimes when students aren't showing up in the ways that we want them to, we assume it's because they don't care. 
And um, I think that's something that we need to abandon. Um, I think students do care deeply. And sometimes they are forced to care for things that are more critical in the moment for them than their, their schooling. And that's just the sad reality is that some students are, are facing things that are bigger than us in this building. Um, and, and they are caring very deeply about the things that are critical in their lives. And they, given the opportunity, given the right, um, the right support, the right environment, they do care deeply about their education. Um, so that's one of the things I, I think that we should try and leave at the door is the idea that, that students don't care when they're not showing up in the ways that, that we would want them to. Man, I am thoroughly <laughs> enjoying this conversation with you. Um, I think you've raised some really great points. You've given me a lot to think about. And I think I, I have um, kind of a final question for you. As I'm, I'm really curious about, right, like I asked you the question, why do you keep showing up on Monday, right? And in a career that's, that's difficult, they say the shelf life is five years, right? What, what brings you the most joy in this position? I just, I think, Part of what keeps me coming back is I genuinely like the students. They're just really cool people. The staff too, for sure. Um, but you know, but I'm not here. I, I am here for the staff, but I'm not here for the staff. I'm here for the students. Um, and just having a genuine appreciation for who they are as people keeps me coming back. And and it, you know, there, it's a, it's just such a cool opportunity to get to know these young people and to know their, their, their passions and their strengths and their fears and their disappointments um, all in all in one package so that's I think that's probably it just a, a genuine appreciation for who they are as individuals yeah I might have lied to you I have one final question <laughs> right because I think about the spirit of mentorship here um, love your answer around joy uh, but there are new teachers walking into buildings every year right there <laughs> I laugh because I know how frantic it is, right? Walking into uh, a classroom or a school building or a space for the first time. And I'm wondering like, what, what advice might you give? You know, novice teachers are people who are new, even in social work, right? Educators in the building um, on how to maintain relationship with students and create the space that you were describing earlier in our conversation. Well, one of the things, I have student interns, I have social work interns that I work with a lot, and one of the things I say frequently to my interns, and I think this is relevant to um, teachers as well, is move toward the chaos. Uh, I think we as humans, we have a natural instinct to back up away from the chaos um, as a self-preservation tactic, but it's so much more effective, I think, when you're working with students. If you see chaos in your classroom, if you see chaos in a person, if you see chaos in a system, move toward it, move toward it. And only by moving toward it can you really better understand it and be effective at like making any change that might be necessary or like seeing it for what it really is. Um, so that's something I, I think about myself a lot. It's something I have to coach myself on sometimes because there is that natural instinct to kind of move away. Um, but I would, tell, I would tell teachers, move toward the chaos, embrace the chaos. It's it's so much more effective, and even though it's scary, it's so much more fulfilling than um, always backing up away from it. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. And I think that's a, um, a perfect way to cap a conversation, right? Move toward the chaos. Uh, feels like a solid piece of advice. <laughs> I get a little nervous thinking about it, but it's, it's yeah. real, right? Because yeah. um, avoidance doesn't serve anyone. So. Right. Jody, I, I appreciate you um, for the work that you do here in the building, uh, for taking the time to have the conversation today, for all the gems and uh, valuable information that you've shared, uh, but really just for being you, right? Well, you. Yeah, Thanks. for sure. Thank you for taking it's the It's been time. great. <laughs> <laughs> Elements of Education is a 501c3 nonprofit organization in Tacoma, Washington, dedicated to changing public education to better serve the specific and diverse needs of students in our public schools. For more information about how you can support the work that we do, please visit elementsofed.org, or you can find us on Instagram at elementsofeducation, or on our website.